things that's really been clear is the amount of anxiety and stress uh, that people have felt uh, because of some of the economic dis that happened here. You have folks wondering, um, you know, when are they going to get back to work? You've had people that have had loss of income. They're worried about their kids. They're worried about their families. And um, that exerts, it's not just an economic uh, toll, which is obviously very important because we want people to do well, um, but it really does. Uh, mental well-being, uh, the stress really mounts, um, and it's a very difficult um, situation. And so, you know, we're sensitive to all those other impacts. I mean, there's a lot of talk about this test result or that. It's obviously important, uh, but there are a whole host of people out there who, who, who won't be infected, haven't been infected, may not even know anyone infected, uh, but are nevertheless profoundly impacted uh, by what is happening uh, with the pandemic. One of the things that I thought was a good use of some of the CARES Act money that we had uh, was to, to serve needs of some of the, our low-income residents, folks who may have fallen on, on hard times, um, and we wanted to dedicate uh, really a historic amount of money uh, from our CARES Act dollars uh, to affordable housing. And so several weeks ago, I announced I dedicate $250 million of the CARES Act funds towards affordable housing assistance. 120 million for short-term rental assistance for tenants and properties within the Florida Housing Finance Corporation's portfolio, 120 million to counties to provide rental and mortgage assistance, and 10 million for special needs, homelessness, housing, and administrative expenses related to the program. And today, I'm proud to announce that the Florida Housing Finance Corp has just approved $75 million to distribute to counties for rental and mortgage assistance. The first distribution to counties of the 120 million rental and mortgage assistance program. Uh, obviously, there'll be more to come. Of that 75 million, I'm pleased to say that Orange County will receive 7.26 million dollars, which is one of the highest in the state. Seminole County will receive 1.1 million, and Osceola will receive 2.5 million. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Floridians who may have already had difficulty making ends meet are now. Uh, suffering even more, uh, losing a job, not being able to find a job, having to figure out how to pay for child care uh, while schools were in distance learning. Uh, this has been a profound disruption to people's lives, and we have a responsibility to help meet needs uh, in this regard. Um, and the disruption has been particularly hard here in Central Florida. If you look at the unemployment numbers that, that were out today, uh, I think the state, the state was 10.7. Uh, uh, you have some parts of the state, obviously, that are less than that. Uh, Central Florida was more than that. Obviously, there's a lot of industries that were very sensitive to the fallout with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so I think certainly here in Central Florida, you know, this is going to serve um, a, a really significant need. Uh, and so this $250 million statewide uh, program with CARES Act money for rental and housing relief, uh, you know, we believe can, can tend to and address at least some of that uncertainty, uh, economic anxiety, uh, and general stress that so many of our residents um, have felt over these many months. So um, I appreciate uh, being able to, to do it here in Central Florida. Uh, we have a couple, a couple special guests here who are going to say a few things. I know we have the mayor here. I know he's working his tail off. Um, but I know that, um, that this is going to be good uh, for, for his county. Um, and then we'll hear from uh, uh, some affordable housing um, view on you know, just how important this is. So, Mayor? Um, good afternoon. Let me begin by saying thank you to Governor DeSantis for coming here to Juan County. And also let me welcome Ms. Uh, Jamie Ross here from the Florida Housing Coalition. Uh, she's been a staunch advocate for those who are uh, underserved with housing throughout Florida now for decades. Uh, let me also say, Governor, thank you for selecting Orange County to receive uh, $7.26 million uh, from the CARES Act funding that the state received. Uh, we believe that it will go a long way within this community. Uh, I heard you allude to the stress that it has caused for our working families here in the state of Florida. Certainly has caused some significant challenges for those mm -hmm. here within this community. Our um, unemployment rate uh, pre-COVID was about 3.3% uh, uh, and it, it soared uh, to 13.3%. Uh, 
And so what I know is that that put a lot of pressure on uh, families to be able to take care of the, their uh, loved ones and to have adequate funding to, to pay for housing. And so this fund, uh, these funds will go a long way. Here in Orange County, uh, we believe that this funding will enhance our existing uh, family assistance programs and complement the activities being funded by the CARES Act uh, dollars already received by the county. Uh, this includes uh, short-term rental assistance and social services for families affected by the pandemic. Uh, overall, Orange County has made a substantial commitment uh, to create a more affordable housing unit for our community such as uh, this facility that you see today. Uh, this has been uh, one of the projects that Orange County has partnered with here at Wellington. This past March, the Board of County Commissioners established a, a local affordable housing trust fund, and that fund was recommended by the Housing for All Task Force that we put in place here in Orange County. The trust fund's initial budget of $10 million will help us uh, better leverage state and federal dollars and expand affordable housing options for our residents here throughout Orange County. And again, uh, I say thank you to the, the tireless advocates who are here for what they do every day to make certain that from a public uh, facing perspective, we are taking care of our families here in Orange County. So, Governor, we will use those funds to honor that commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Brian Nelson, Mayor of the City of Apopka. Thank you, Governor, for coming down to Central Florida, and particularly my town of Popka. We appreciate what you're doing for the state. The $7 million obviously will help for the short term. As we look at, you know, as the numbers come back and we start, you know, our, our theme parks start filling back up, the, the unemployment rate should, should decrease, which should make it a lot easier on our folks here. But for now, that's a great stopgap. But as we look forward, I think uh, with the partnership between the state and the county, we here in the, uh, in the Popka area have really done a lot here in the last several years with this Wellington and Brixton landings and the, uh, the, the uh, um, affordable housing complex put on by uh, kind of like, uh, Habitat. Uh, Habitat for Humanity. We've had two, Orlando and Habitat of Popka. <coughs> Hannibal Square is looking to put another project in a Popka. So as we look long term, that's what we're looking for is how do we you know, engage our community get them into something that's affordable and get them get get them off the streets, get them out of you know, un, unsafe housing and get them into a, a house that they'll be proud of and that they will live their, their, their life out in. So we'd like to thanks again to the governor for doing this. We appreciate the short-term help and as we, we move forward, we want to make sure that long-term we've got great solutions for our members here in the Apopka community. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jamie Ross. I'm the CEO of the Florida Housing Coalition, a statewide nonprofit that provides training and technical assistance on everything affordable housing from ending homelessness to first time home ownership. I'm really honored to be here today on behalf of the Sadowski Coalition. The Sadowski Coalition is actually 32 statewide organizations. So my comments are on behalf of the Sadowski Coalition. And my comments are that. We cannot say enough good about, about Governor DeSantis and his support for affordable housing. As soon as he came into office, he put in his budget full appropriation for the state and local housing trust funds. And then he did it again in the second year. And now he's taken $250 million out of the CARES funds and directed it to help people with housing between now and the end of the year. So we have also a great uh, gratitude in the way it's being done with the Florida Housing Finance Corporation because the money is being administered through the SHIP programs. That's very important because our SHIP administrators immediately launched into action as soon as the governor declared the disaster and they reprogrammed their SHIP monies to use it the way the CARES money can be used for rental assistance, for uh, mortgage foreclosure prevention. And now, with the announcement that the governor's made today, they'll be able to use federal money for that and use their SHIP money 
uh, for the, the, the ship activities, which are so critical and which we will get back to again uh, in the beginning uh, of January 2021. Uh, I just, uh, just cannot express enough uh, how grateful we are to have a governor who really is a housing champion. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, Hannah, Mayor, this is for you. <laughs> Seven million big ones right there. <laughs> oh, there we Who gets thumbs up? getting back where we wanted and uh, we really uh, view Central Florida as such an important engine for the state uh, and I want to thank everyone for coming and thanks for, uh, for all that they've been doing you know, to help, uh, help these folks. Uh, I have a, a number of updates in terms of the, the COVID-19. Uh, I've been working with the President and the Vice President uh, as well as uh, other members of the administration uh, to accelerate more of the treatment remdesivir. Um, it's a drug that has been used uh, to treat people who come in uh, with COVID-like illnesses. Most of the physicians I've spoken to around the state uh, believe that it has been uh, effective at reducing hospital stays and taking a patient who may be on, would be on the verge of going to an ICU if they were left unabated and, and keeping them in a, in a more stable uh, condition. Um, we expedited a shipment uh, last weekend as people thought, as, as hospitals said they were running low, um, you know, they want more, uh, which we want to help deliver on. Uh, so the White House um, is accelerating more remdesivir to the state of Florida. We think it's going to ship uh, this weekend. Uh, and obviously, we'll be working uh, with, with all the hospitals. It will go directly from the distributor to the hospital. So the state's not going to be involved in parceling it out. Uh, but I really want to thank the president, uh, the vice president, for uh, you know, understanding that, that this is something that is important for people in the state of Florida, for some of our patients who've gone into the hospital and uh, doing all they can to be able to accelerate that. I also spoke with the head of the company who makes it, Jalee, uh, and they are um, you know, working to continue to, to crank out uh, uh, these, um, these medications, and so we appreciate them uh, for doing that. I also want to just make a point about hospital capacity. Uh, you'll see these different headlines saying there's no capacity here or there. Uh, just understand, we have 21% of the beds statewide um, are available. That's a greater percentage than was available in early March before the pandemic took off. I mean, uh, typically hospitals run at 90% uh, or 88, 90%. That's how they stay in business. Um, and so now we have less than 80% of the beds um, are actually in use. Uh, so there is capacity. Uh, and particularly, I think this is important because what we saw in March and April, and part of it was the fear of the coronavirus, but I think part of it was people didn't think that they could be seen at a hospital because there was a narrative that somehow the hospitals didn't have capacity. That was obviously not true in Florida then. And so people that have heart or stroke, they deferred going into the ED, deferred seeking treatment, uh, and that was big numbers across the country. That has led to more significant uh, conditions now. So I've spoken to physicians here in Florida, and there are patients, not for COVID, but they're in, in uh, ICUs who have more significant uh, ailments as a result of deferring care. And I think you're seeing that across the country. Uh, so, so if you need care, seek care. It's not a single hospital um, you know, CEO that I've spoken to that said, don't send anybody here. They say, this is our job, and we're going to do it. They also have the ability, they have capacity. One of the things that, that has been an issue is just making sure you have enough personnel. So the state, we've sent uh, hundreds of, of, of medical personnel to different parts of, of the state, particularly the Miami-Dade County, and uh, we're going to continue to be supportive in that regard. Part of it is just the fact that you know, as you go along with this, as there's community transmission, some of the, the staff can get infected. And obviously, that's something that, um, that, that, that would put somebody on the sidelines, potentially. So having this personnel is very important. And so we're supportive of that. I also think the federal government's going to be sending some teams to supplement and uh, potentially the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, I spoke with the secretary the other day, so we anticipate support there. But the bottom line is, you know, we have capacity. Uh, we have the ability to care for people. And COVID, while it's important, that's just a fraction 
of the people that are in hospitals on any given day. And all those other conditions also need attention as well. Uh, our long-term care uh, support uh, is ongoing. Uh, those uh, long-term care residents, you know, they, about 150,000 long-term care residents in the state of Florida, mostly in their 70s and 80s, uh, most of them have, have health uh, problems. Uh, you know, they represent uh, from just that community you know, almost 50% of the COVID-related fatalities in the state of Florida. And so they're the most at-risk group. Uh, we've obviously done a lot in terms of you know, not letting visitation, not letting sick patients be discharged back into nursing homes, uh, sending PPE, requiring PPE. We've tested all the nursing homes um, and, and, and all those things are good. We have set up, now we have um, uh, even expanded number of COVID only nursing homes so that if somebody is in the hospital um, and they're contagious but they don't need hospital level of care, they can be discharged to this COVID-only facility where, where they'll be appropriately isolated. Or if they're in their nursing home and they test positive, but they don't need to go to the hospital, leaving them there could spread it to other people so you have a place to be able to transfer. So we have over a thousand beds uh, operational throughout the state for COVID-only nursing homes. Two sites are operational uh, in Brevard County, uh, one site uh, here in Orlando, and uh, there's gonna be another one added in Orange County uh, next week. So by the time some of the additional beds come on, and we have many beds in, in Southern Florida, you know, you're looking at uh, probably close to 1,800 beds uh, that will be in these COVID-only facilities serving as a step up from a nursing home and a step down from the hospital. That's a way to keep the spread from uh, spreading in these nursing homes and long-term care facilities, which is our most, uh, our most vulnerable population. Testing has been going through the roof in the state of Florida. I mean, you hear about the positive tests, which obviously that's part of it, but the number of tests being conducted um, or unlike anything we thought we would be able to accomplish, we've averaged over the last seven days uh, over 100,000 tests a day. And uh, when we were in the height of the March and April, we were doing between 7,500 and 10,000 tests a day. When we went into May with our, um, with our phase one, we, we said we want to accelerate testing, we want to get more testing out there, and our goal was about 30,000 a day. Uh, so now we're doing 100,000. Part of that is because of our long-term care testing, uh, but this is an inordinate amount of testing. Uh, I think what we're seeing is the percentage of new cases that are positive um, has stabilized and even you know, maybe slightly down from where it was two weeks ago where we were pretty much 14 to 16 percent. You know, now we are probably, you know, more of like, you know, 12, 13 percent. And here in Central Florida, they're below the state average. I mean, you've had Orange County has been in that 10, even a little lower. Brevard has been in the back in the single digits. They used to be two percent. Then they started getting the double digits. You know, Lake has been around that 10 percent mark, a little less than that. Seminole, I think, is stabilized, and, and hopefully, we'll be going back down into single digits. Uh, so. We definitely have seen stabilization. Even in Southern Florida, we've seen stabilization in terms of the percentage of people um, who are testing positive. Obviously, we want to go back to where we were in May and the beginning of June, where we had a lot of places around the state that were testing three, four percent positivity. I mean, you, you figure two, one or two percent may just be false positives. So if you get in there, you're in really good shape. Uh, we also are working to accelerate test results for people. Uh, these commercial labs, by and large, will tell you, if you get them a sample, they'll turn it around in 48 hours. But I think in practice, what we've seen, there are people go through our drive through sites, and sometimes they don't get results for 7 to 10 days. So just think about, even from their perspective, you just wait and wait and wait. That's not ideal for, for a patient, of course. It's also not good for medical professionals because they don't have an answer about whether somebody is actually infected or not. And so you assume they are if they're in the hospital as a PUI, and so it's just not, not a good situation. Um, we have, uh, the Department of Emergency Management has severed ties with one of the labs who was taking a week, uh, diverting that business from our drive through sites to labs who pledged to do better. We're just gonna keep monitoring, but at the end of the day, uh, if, you, if you pledge to do a certain number of turnaround, we wanna see that because it's really important uh, that the folks who are getting tested get an answer um, in a decent interval. 
Uh, what we've rolled out today along those lines, and this is happening at the Orange County Convention Center here in Central Florida, it's also happening in Fort Lauderdale, in Miami-Dade, and then in Jacksonville at the Regency Mall, is for symptomatic people, because remember, most a lot of the people who are testing now would not have been tested in March. A lot of them uh, may have been exposed, but they don't necessarily have symptoms. Um, but the people that have symptoms, obviously those are the ones that we really need the results back as quickly as possible. So for those folks who've developed the COVID symptoms, uh, there's gonna be lanes where you can go in, utilize a self swab, uh, send it to, we have a couple companies uh, who have a good track record and the goal is to get that turned around much quicker than what we've been seeing in some of these other commercial labs. So that starts today. We're obviously gonna monitor the data on that and, and really hold people accountable. But I can tell you, we've had a lot of luck dealing with one of these companies in, with our long-term care testing. Typically that will get sent and we'll get a result um, by the time the lab receives the specimen in under 30 hours. And so that's a really good turnaround time. So we're gonna be looking at that because we know it's important. We've also, the state for Department of Emergency Management has put out new retail sites at Home Depots. Uh, so we have four new sites that have come online, Tallahassee, Leesburg, Jacksonville, and Oviedo. So you have two right here in Central Florida at the Home Depots and those are just now, if you're shopping, if you want to get tested, uh, you can. And uh, I know a lot of people have been taking advantage of that. When you're looking at the test numbers and the positivity and all that, it is very important to scrutinize that in terms of the age groups because we know the coronavirus you know, disproportionately impacts folks who are elderly. And not just 65 and older, really, as you get into 75 and 85, you know, that changes dramatically even there. Uh, and so when you're seeing positive tests come from 20 year olds, 25 year olds, uh, it's important to point out, you know, absent a significant underlying health issue, you know, those folks are, are typically asymptomatic uh, or have mild symptoms and, and very few require hospitalization. Um, and so those numbers just need context. And here's, I think, part of what, what is driving the positivity. Uh, for the whole pandemic, the positivity rate for people 18 to 24, and, and really most of that bulk is kind of that 21, 22, is 17%. On the other hand, 65 to 84 is 6.5% positivity. And so it's those, those elderly folks are our most vulnerable that we really need to protect. Um, that, that is the most important cohort. Obviously, we'd like to see everybody have as low positivity as possible, uh, but, but the younger folks, you know, are still driving not only the case numbers, but really also helping to drive the positivity. And that really brings us to uh, kind of going forward, uh, protecting our most vulnerable um, is the best way for us to reduce mortality and morbidity. Uh, if you look at the case fatality rate in Florida, it's about 1.5%. The national average is about 4%. Many of the other states, um, particularly in the Northeast, are five, six, seven percent case fatality rates. Um, we obviously want to continue to have as low uh, as we can, and a lot of that just depends on making sure the nursing homes have support, and then our 65 and older community, which we have seen uh, exercise a lot of care and caution throughout the whole pandemic. But our advice, um, advisory from March has always been to avoid crowds and minimize close contact with individuals outside the home. If you are in that 65 and up category or if you're somebody that does have a significant underlying condition, uh, our long-term care residents, uh, we're protecting by continuing a lot of the things that we've done, but now we're testing all the staff every two weeks. So that's 200,000 people that work at over 4,000 long-term care facilities throughout the state of Florida. Uh, we've now had uh, samples taken from all 200,000 over the last two weeks. This is kind of our first week doing that after we had gone through and tested everybody over a, over a couple, um, couple month period. Uh, and fortunately, unfortunately, their people test positive. Fortunately, the rate of positive is significantly lower than statewide. It's been a little under 3%. Uh, when they test positive, they're isolated, and then any residents who came in contact with them are obviously given an opportunity to test and they're monitored for symptoms. So that's an important way to keep COVID from really spreading in the most vulnerable areas. And I will just end by saying this, you know, we are seeing some positive trends in the data. Uh, if you look at, at Orange County and some of the Central Florida areas, 
they've seen their positivity stabilize and, and decline. I think it's going to decline a lot more, but that's where it is. Uh, visits to emergency departments for COVID-like illnesses have declined uh, for seven days here in the state of Florida, um, and that is uh, really a leading indicator uh, about people who are going to be admitted or not admitted to hospitals. Uh, so, so I think that uh, you know we're in a point of where the testing has, has has been relatively stable, and we're testing a lot. Obviously, uh, the ED visits uh, there's a downward trend on that. So I think if we can kind of keep doing the basic things uh, that they're doing here in other parts of the state, uh, that's really going to help us uh, get through the next two weeks. And so for anyone who's um, you know, in those vulnerable groups, 65 and plus, just understand uh, some of those younger cohorts, the people in their 20s and 30s, uh, you know, this is circulating uh, more significantly in those age groups. Uh, than, than it would be in, in some of the other age groups. And so, you know, as you, as you limit your contact, keep that in mind and, and do the best that you can to protect yourself because, uh, you know, we want to make sure we get through this um, in, in the best possible shape that we can. With that, take some questions. Governor, the County School Board just voted for their innovation plan. Okay, I'll do one at a time. Yes, sir. There was an unpublished report from the White House about the coronavirus task force saying there were hot dead states such as Florida recommend closing bars. I know our bars are already closed. Uh, it also recommends gyms. It says this report was given to all the governors. What is your stance on that report about Florida being a hot bed and do you have any suggestions? Well, obviously, I think if you look at the Sun Belt, I mean, you know, we've all seen the same movement in terms of, um, in terms of increased prevalence. I think the fact that we're testing so much has led to case numbers that have been put out there and I think kind of unfairly uh, you know, maligning the state as being something, if, if some of those states like New York and New Jersey were testing 100,000 a day at their height, they would have had 40,000 or 50,000 cases a day. So I think it's important to put that in perspective, but there's no doubt that we've seen from Southern California to South Carolina, including Florida, Texas, Arizona, uh, you know, we've seen an increase um, uh, of spread and obviously, as I mentioned, a lot of spread with some of the younger folks. And so um, with, uh, with the pubs, they, they've never been open in Southern Florida. So just you know, put that. And then when we did the phase two, it was basically they had to do similar to, uh, uh, to a restaurant, the limited capacity and the seating. And when people follow the guidelines, never had any problems, but obviously there was an issue with a lot of non-compliance, and so that's why they ended up doing that. Um, in terms of the, the gyms, we've not had a lot of problems with that, um, and so you know, that's not something that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close, uh, partially because if you look, you talk to any physician, particularly the people that are under 50, uh, if you're in good shape, you know, you have a very, very low likelihood uh, of ending up um, in significant uh, condition as a result of the coronavirus. I mean, the people that they're seeing in there have uh, overwhelmingly uncontrolled comorbidities. A lot of folks have hypertension, diabetes, are very morbidly obese. And so I think taking that option away uh, for people to be healthy just doesn't make sense. And we haven't really seen that as a major vector. I know it could be theoretically. Anything you do theoretically could do it. But I think most of the people that are going to gyms uh, are in the low risk groups. And I think what they're doing is making them even less risk uh, for the coronavirus. So I don't think it would make sense to close it. Yes, ma'am. The Orange County School District just voted to put their plan forward, but what they want is some community control that if the numbers don't back down, that they could not open those brick and mortar schools. Would you back that decision? And if you did, would you put more money into those kinds of districts for online? So what I said from the beginning is we got to work with every community uh, as we see their circumstances. and. Uh, the, the, the state is very diverse anyways, but if you look at how the epidemic has unfolded, it's not unfolded evenly across the state. I think that, quite frankly, I think Central Florida, as we get into next month, probably in pretty good shape just based on the trends I see. That's what I hope. But obviously, you know, they need to have the ability to um, you know, make decisions in the parent parents' input is going to be important. Uh, my, uh, one of my overriding principles is that uh, parents should have options. And if they choose distance learning because they're not comfortable in a school setting, then that's for them. If there are parents that really want to have some in-person instruction, you know, I think school districts should do whatever they can to provide that, particularly for our very young, young students. I think one of the things that we're really concerned about is some of the learning gaps that will develop in the K-5. And when you're doing that, when you're falling behind in reading especially, uh, that could have a lifetime of effects. And so for me, you know, I look particularly at 
those elementary school kids. And the science on that is just overwhelming. Yes, they're at almost zero risk, uh, but even more than that, transmission from a, an elementary school to an adult is extremely rare. I think generally for schools, the kids aren't vectors. You know, as you get into 17, 18, I think you can probably find some examples of that. But man, those primary school kids, uh, I, I just, I really am concerned about having to do that. But I've told all the school districts, um, you know, look, this is a team effort. Uh, you represent different constituencies. You have different things happening in your community. So we just need to be sensitive to that. But we also need to be sensitive to the harm that will come if while, of course, giving parents the ability to offer distance, if you shut out those parents who really believe it's important to get some in-person instruction. And I know, look, I think most of these folks in the schools, the team, I think most of them want to be there because they realize how important it is. Uh, Safety is important, but we also need to really look at the data and let the facts drive it. I do not think that we should be swept up in, in, in fear. I think there's a lot of fear uh, out there, and obviously that there's there, that, that's risk for the mill, and, and, and that, that is stoked. Um, but I think we just look at the situation, you know, we can figure out you know, how to get this done. I'm confident of that. Uh, we've got a lot of great, talented people uh, working in our school system, and so um, you know we'll be working with them. But this is an evolving situation, and um, and I think folks understand that. So that's a yes. Um, some, something similar to what uh, was done for first responders and healthcare workers at first. Would you consider a state-funded testing site just for educator, bus drivers, and school administrators during the school year? Of course we would, but I would also just say um, what we found with this testing is, you know, there's a limited utility in testing healthy people. You know, we thought you test healthy people without symptoms, you identify that they're positive, you isolate them, and that stops the spread. The problem is, is, you know, if they don't get the results back for seven days, then are they going to isolate in the meantime? If, if they have no symptoms whatsoever, if you're just randomly testing people or you're doing it periodically, um, you know, we do it in the long-term care facilities just because, you know, it's, if that gets in there, just the chance of something happening. So, but like just from the general public, I'm not sure how much it's actually been, been effective. So I, I obviously would want to offer support in any way we can, but I think that one of the things that's problematic about it is you can test positive 30 days after an infection. So you, the, the virus is dead, you're not infectious, but it can pick up the RNA. Uh, and so what, you're gonna be two weeks not being allowed to, do, to, to leave your house when you're really not even infectious. So how you do that, I think we, we need to really discuss what makes the most sense. We went into mass testing, and look, I was one of the biggest advocates for it. Uh, you know, a lot of what they've done in other countries is really the symptom-based testing. And it's not clear to me that, that they're worse off than doing um, you know, what we're doing. So the answer is yes, we would definitely help. But I think we have to, as we get through this cycle um, and get on the other side of this hump, you know, we've probably got to discuss what makes the most sense with testing. Because one of the things I fear is you go get tested. You know, it's your turn to get tested, let's say. And you get a result back in a week, and it's negative. But then two days before you got the result back, you got infected. And so these, these negative results for healthy people, it is not a, a clean bill of health infinitum. Now we are doing more and more antibody testing and I would, I would definitely recommend, we have a lot of first responders, healthcare workers who've been doing it. We opened it up to the general public at some of our sites, including Orange County Convention Center. And the numbers over the last week, you know, have really gone up, which is a good sign because that means there's more immunity built up in the population. I think today's, the numbers from yesterday, I think 14.7% tested positive uh, for antibodies. And I think, you know, once you get in that 15% seroprevalence, you know, that, that contributes to resistance of this thing being spread. So antibody testing, I think, needs to be a part of the equation. And I just think we need to recognize the limits of what PCR testing can do. Uh, we, there's rap, you know, the rapid tests that were developed, the problem with, with some of them is 
one, there's just not enough to go around. And so I have money. I, if I could order them, I would. But uh, they're mostly going to hospitals. But even some of the hospitals have seen some of them have not been accurate. They've had false positives or false negatives. And so that's a problem. I and mean, we've had this, this one test we're doing at this mobile RV lab. It's a 45-minute test. But what happens is 5% are false positives. So when you test positive, they have to rerun the sample and sometimes take another sample to confirm it. So that's not ideal because the last thing you want is for someone to think they have it when they actually don't. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I think we're learning about this testing. And uh, but I'm definitely not one that thinks that you know every student has to be tested every week or anything like that. It just it, one I think functionally it, it wouldn't work. Um, so I think if if someone develops a symptom, a student, obviously they isolate, they stay home, then you should test them immediately, and then you can do the contact tracing. I mean, that is going to be the most effective use uh, of what we're doing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's why I think you're talking about the Secretary uh, Corcoran's mandate suggesting that it was a recommendation. Do you agree with that right now, and what do you think about Orange County's plan? Yeah, so well, I haven't looked at Orange County's plan, but I think what he was trying to do is say, you know, the goal should be to get kids back in the classroom, and we want people thinking along those lines. But, uh, you know, the way it's structured, if you actually look at the way it's structured, it's not exactly mandatory. I know it's been pretty, it's like the Department of Health has to do this, all this other stuff. So I think what it's doing is just focusing people on what's this going to look like and, um, and going forward. And so, uh, but, I, but I've said many times, because I just believe being in a diverse state, you have to do it. Yeah, it got to be sensitive to the different communities and, and what they're dealing with. But I, I believe Orange County could certainly offer in person, given the trend that they're on, and, um, and I think they'll be in pretty good shape uh, by next month. I mean, they just, you know, Orange County has one of the lowest case fatality rates for a county this size. Um, I think it's less than half a percent. Now, obviously, you know, you don't want to have any fatalities, and so anytime you see that, um, you know, it's difficult and it's tragedy. But I'll tell you, you look at some of these other places around the, the country, uh, some of these counties have 10% you know, case fatality. And, um, and I think that they've really done a good job here. Governor, 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 are you saying there would be no penalties for a school district that doesn't open in person? Look, my goal is not to penalize people. My goal is to give our kids opportunity and recognize that when we talk about the coronavirus, it's very important. Uh, but in terms of everything, all the effects of it, there's been so many effects on people who probably don't even know anyone that's ever been affected, and particularly um, our, our kids. The distance learning, as, as, as good as Florida's system is compared to other states in the country, the distance learning is not the same. There is an academic gap that has developed. And look, we are in a very difficult situation in March. People didn't know whether this thing was, uh, whether kids were big vectors. We, I think it was pretty obvious that the kids were lower risk, but there was still, you know, data was coming in on that. Um, you know, now we have more information. And, and my thing is just, you know, for parents who you know, have any type of misgivings, obviously, um, I think it'd be so counterproductive to tell them you have to go in person. I mean, it wouldn't even work. It's not the right thing to do. They have the ability to opt. But I also think we do have to be sensitive to parents who really believe that the school experience is important for their kids. And so we've got to do whatever we can to, to kind of meet that. But I think that's just got to be done because it's the right thing to do. I mean, you know, to, to get into a, a tit for tat and to do that in the midst of a crisis, that's not what I'm looking to do. I mean, I want to work collaboratively with people. And uh, I, just want, I just want opportunities for our kids. Uh, I, want, I do not want people falling behind. I'm concerned about what will happen. I'm concerned about just being able to be a part of the school community, having that the pride of the kids. I'm concerned about not having activities, being in the band, doing theater, playing sports. You know, we're out um, looking at, you know, our, our, our athletes, you know, they need to be able to be out there. So there's all these different things. Um, but I think that to be in, in a situation where you're trying to penalize or not, probably not the way to go. Well, there were, guys, last question, there. we've well, had nearly 5,000 fatalities in the state. Do you take responsibility for any of those deaths? 
Well, I think every time you have uh, fatalities for any reason, I think it's a tragedy. And um, you know, we certainly uh, have seen uh, fatalities in Florida, uh, particularly you know, recently. We've seen, we've seen fatalities, particularly places down in Miami-Dade. Um, and it's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, I also think, though, that because of our efforts, you know, if you compare how we handle our most vulnerable population uh, with our long-term care facilities uh, by limiting access immediately, by having PPE, we were sending, we were the only state sending massive shipments of PPE to our long-term care facilities. I dispatched the National Guard to test the residents. We've got 4,000 facilities to test that. We've put in a huge effort to test the staff so that we can catch infections before they spread. And I guarantee you, had we not done that, we would have had thousands of more of our most vulnerable would have passed away. And had we done policies like were done in some of the other states where they were forcing the nursing homes to have infectious patients, it would have been way, way worse. And so um, I think the efforts have been targeted. I think the efforts have definitely uh, saved lives. Uh, we're not out of the woods, obviously, and I think it's a difficult situation. But would you rather have our case fatality rate, our deaths per million, which are lower than many of these other states, which many of them are hailed as successes just because the virus is burnt out there? Um, but I think we've really focused on our most vulnerable, on our senior citizens generally, but particularly you know those folks um, in our long-term care facilities. But we're not talking about other states. We're talking about our states. You take responsibility. Thanks, guys. We'll see. We'll be back soon.